Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Well, on this Sunday of the forefathers, the Sunday before they need to leave our Lord Jesus Christ, I hope through the grace of our Lord and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I hope to inspire all of you with this word that although we are, we just heard the incredible genealogy of our Lord according to Matthew, and Matthew's genealogy is to give an, the inspiration, the hope, and the anchoring of the proof that Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah to the Jewish people, whereas the genealogy in Luke is to show to the Gentiles that he is the chosen Son of God. And so, whereas Luke begins uh, the genealogy from Adam to Christ, Matthew begins with Abraham. And beginning with Abraham, we hear the story of the children of Israel. Children of Israel, remember the name Israel. Jacob having his name changed. Why? Because struggling with God and prevailing. The history of Israel is a history of struggle. Abraham coming out of a land which was not his, a land of his, excuse me, coming out of the land of his fathers and going to a land that was not his. All through the line, all through this genealogy, so many stories. Rahab the harlot, Tamar, who was denied children and who tricked her father-in-law to give her rightful heirs. The various sons of King David, Solomon, the tragedies between these families, broken families, betrayal. And even up until the time of our Lord, what a tragic and seemingly scandalous story of Mary bearing a child and the father not being Joseph. All of these tend to a scandal. It's important because we who are on the old calendar, we have a great opportunity to remember the scandal of Christmas. The 25th. And there is a battle over the 25th, even, unfortunately, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, may God strengthen them, being subject to the change of the calendar for civil reasons. Make no mistake that there is always a political nefarious reason behind these things because we are all too aware that in our society, in our culture, in our time, that although the 25th is quaint and it's nice and it's fine, But the reality is, is that each year, seemingly, it seems that Christ is removed from Christmas and that commercial endeavors and really a saccharine sweetness is continually injected into the holiday. One in where movies are given to us to make us feel good, to give us the idea that all of our problems are really just a matter of having bad character and that all you need is just the right solution to come through and everything's going to be okay. And that is not what happens in Christmas. In fact, we should always remember that Christmas should be, next to Pascha, one of the greatest mo- moments of celebration for us. Why? Because Jesus, which means he shall, save, he shall save his people from their sins. What sins? What sins? Murder. Fratricide. Think of Herod and the slaughter of the children. All of these things, these are all part of the story of Christmas. And a move to make it clean and sweet is a move to neuter the gospel, to take the punch out of the power of the gospel, to turn the gospel into one more mythology with the Grinch and with Scrooge and with all these things that just take Christmas and make it about having better character. But better character won't connect you with God. Better character may make your life a little bit smoother, but it won't unite you to God. It won't open you with the right kind of desperation to say, I need a Savior. We needed a Savior. Mankind had no hope outside of the Savior. And this is why when we read the genealogy, it's unfortunate for us because we're also biblically illiterate. But for those of us who have a little bit of biblical understanding, we know that every time you read a story, every one of those names is a story of tragedy. 
Not one of those names is a sweet name. Gentiles are intermixed in there. And make no mistake, that's a scandal. The whole thing is a scandal. And it's precisely such. Because without God, we're dead in our sins. And this is what the gospel reveals to us today. But even more importantly, and the reason why we celebrate Christmas, is because God did give us a gift. And that isn't quaint. That isn't sweet. It's joyous. It's triumphant. The incarnation is the pledge and the promise that God created us with good intentions. And although we fell because of our sins, God loves us enough to give us a way, to give us a plan, to unite us back to him. This is always the plan. And when you read each one of those names, you're tempted to either fall into despair or you're tempted to see it the right way, which is to give God glory and to say that no matter what happens to us, you've always had a plan. You've always had a way for us to come back to you. You've always had a way for us to return to our original state. And that's what it means when you take Holy Communion on the Christmas liturgy. That's what it means when you prepare your heart as a manger to receive Christ inside you. That's what it means when you set aside during fasting the things that you enjoy so that you can have a sense of what we lost. So that on the Christmas liturgy, you can return. It can mean something to you. That it won't just be another liturgy. It won't just be something that we do. It won't be just one more quaint thing that we add on top of candy canes and reindeer. But it will remind us as the people of God what the cost was. And that even now, there is no amen. We're waiting for that final amen because all of our lives are tinged with tragedy. All of our lives are still tinged with the sin. But now, the Messiah has come. And now, if we invite him in, he can take the tragedy and the scandals of our lives and he can weave our story into that story of salvation. And then the sin and the brokenness of our lives become an opportunity for worship. Because God, if we allow him in, will make a bright star to shine. And he will unite us. And he will take us unto him and deal with our tragedy and deal with our sin accordingly. And he'll deal with it in such a way that he would live his life within us. And so as we prepare for the Nativity Liturgy on this Sunday, I pray that God will allow us to give thanks for our unique opportunity that our Christmas celebration is separated from societies. That our Christmas celebration is separated in such a way that we can remember and we can know why Christmas is. May God help us to keep this feast and this fast always separate and pure. May it never be defiled by the sacrament and the delusion of society. For the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen.